he came on cushioned feet. His step regal and full of purpose. A gentle giant who touched the hearts of all whose path he crossed. Big boy. An elephant like no other. This was his home, Zambia's Lower Zambezi Valley, a beautiful wild place where life keeps pace with the steady flow of the river. A place where the spirit of Africa lives and breathes. A place of elephants, a place of men. Elephants have had to share the valley with humans since the times of the ancient ones. Theirs has been an uneasy relationship in spite of the fact that they have so much in common. Fear and mistrust kept distance between them. Man hunted elephants for their precious ivory. Contact between them invariably ended in the death of one or both. And so elephants soon learned to avoid human beings at all cost. But Big Boy changed all that. His intelligence was matched by his curiosity. So when man began to live alongside him, he did not move away, but rather watched and listened and learned. So Boot and Chris Liebenberg, who set up a safari camp in Big Boy's favorite territory, where the Chongwe River meets the Zambezi, watched and listened back. Big Boy pretty much was here when I arrived, and that would have been the end of 95. This Alberta Grove is always full of elephant, and he was always, he was yeah, He was a prominent elephant when we first arrived here. We came back, what, 15 years plus. And myself and a friend of mine, Gary Bra, we came in here pretty green and unexperienced, and all we had was one vehicle, and we kind of set up a bit of a camp, and uh, there was Ellie's coming through this Alberta Grove constantly all day. So, you know, we were a little bit nervous and whatever, not very experienced in the bush, and Big Boy was here pretty much as we, when we got here. The relationship between Big Boy and his human neighbors grew steadily, and with it, an incredible level of trust was formed. He was just, well, not just big, but had a certain noble, manner about him. He never sort of where the other youngsters would constantly want to wrestle and grapple. He kept peace and if they got out of hand he would go across and sort them out. He 
just seemed to be a bit of a calming influence on on the other elephants and he was the least aggressive and and sort of seemed to be the least phased by by our presence. You're just such a, an amazing animal besides the fact he was magnificent specimen. I mean great big tusks and far bigger than any other elephant around the valley. Yeah, we noticed he was special straight away just because of his of his size and good looks, really. Um, big ivory and his huge elephant. Um, it was a pleasure to have him in the camp all the time. He was certainly a lot bigger than, than any other elephants around, even the other sort of fully grown bulls. He was, he was just a really good specimen. He had such a way about him, you couldn't help but warm to him. Um, When Butt and Chris met him, Big Boy was the mentor of nine younger bulls. Such is the way of life for male elephants who leave their families when they become sexually mature, forming small bachelor groups which are tutored by an older, wiser bull. Under this tutelage, the young bulls, nicknamed Askaris, a Swahili word for soldier, learn the intricacies of acceptable elephant behavior before they finally split up and go their separate ways. Eventually, passing the knowledge on to bachelor groups of their own. There are echoes of our own social structures in this behavior, as well as in many other aspects of elephant society. Just like us, they love. Play. Fight. And grieve. Their families are headed up by a single dominant female, a matriarch. She is the cornerstone of family life, meeting out discipline where it is needed, while maintaining absolute order. Elephants are tactile creatures, constantly touching one another reassuring, playing, and showing affection. In the Lower Zambezi, days begin the same for elephant and humankind. Dawn is a magical time of stillness as night submits slowly and reluctantly to the onset of day. The first rays of the sun gently kiss the mighty river awake, and all those who live in it and on its banks begin their daily routine.
As the sun steadily rises, the elephants make their way to water. The seemingly random ramble to the river is in fact a coordinated march to an ancient rhythm which governs the lives of big boys' kin. They follow in the footsteps of those who have gone before. A rite of passage passed on from mother to child. Wisdom and knowledge constantly shared in low, inaudible rumbles which enable the herds to communicate over huge distances. Life for Big Boy began this way. After 22 months in his mother's womb, he entered the world as a tiny new addition to a large extended family. His days spent suckling on mother's milk and discovering that his trunk seems to have a mind of its own. Like all babies, it will have taken him a few months to learn how to properly control the thousands of muscles it contains. Months of exploring. Stretching. Curling. Swatting. Poking prodding and caressing. Until finally, the elongated appendage is under his command and able to perform a seemingly endless variety of roles on cue. But its most important role is that of feeding. Because they digest only 40% of what they eat, elephants feed constantly, whether grazing on the succulent grasses at the river's edge or browsing on leaves and branches from the trees which line the banks. for young elephants are spent learning about the world around them. Playing with one another and the creatures and plants which share their world.
just like us. They are adventurous, mischievous, and excitable, often needing the firm trunk of an older family member to set them back on their feet. It's not just elephants who benefit from the bounties the Zambezi provides. Hippos spend their days in the water, which protects their sensitive skins from the sun. In this way, they conserve precious energy, feeding occasionally on water hyacinth and other aquatic plants. As the sun sets, they emerge to graze, spending their hours of darkness on land, searching for the soft grasses and other vegetation which makes up the bulk of their diet. The buffalo also makes use of the river's waters, cooling off in the heat of the day in muddy pools along its edge. Where there are buffalo, there are lions. Lethargic during the daytime heat, by night, the lower Zambezi prides are transformed into spectral hunters, shadowing the herds of buffalo and impala under cover of darkness, waiting for the opportune moment to strike. The Zambezi shares its riches freely. But there is one who has not yet learned to share. Man. Days in the village of Muguramena begin much as they do for the elephants of the Lower Zambezi. The women's first job is to fetch water from the river, ensuring that everyone has enough to last the day. They spend their days watching over their children and preparing food, their lifestyle, a curious mirror image of their elephant counterparts. At times, life is seemingly idyllic. But all is not as harmonious as it would appear. There is conflict here. The elephants raid the crops and their ivory is much sought after, bringing death to the valley in the form of the poacher's gun. We knew poachers were in the valley. Mike Stark, who is the manager of a camp upstream from here, and I, the week before, found 11 elephants on this first plane between us and the next camp, which is Chihuahua that had been shot in one week. So you can imagine that sort of slaughter. There was, uh, you know, there was certainly rampant poaching going on. I think it was 96 or 95, 96, I can't remember the exact year, but I mean, we, we counted in excess of about 60 to 80, I can't remember again the exact figures. That was elephant carcasses on our game drive loops that we actually saw. Um, so what was often the deeper bush that we never knew about, you, know, you can only, only guess, but it, there's easily in excess of 100, 120 or maybe even more elephants poached in this area in that one year alone. During the dry season we can control it because there are camps operating and the operators themselves, their presence in the park stops the poachers. But once November and the rains come, 
everybody closes up for the rainy season. And that's when Chris would go off to do his ski operations overseas. And the moment you vacate this park, then it's open season with the poachers. So came about the fear and mistrust between elephant and man. The fight for food and space and man's greed for ivory driving a wedge between them. But Big Boy seemed immune to the dangers around him. His calm, gentle nature was that of a peace bringer, not a warmonger. He kind of had a little bit of a regal air about him because he'd always have these Ascaris around him. And I suppose his, his peaceable nature and his, you know, his, the way he behaved was in contrast to these young bulls also who were always nervy and, and, and running around sort of getting a bit agitated. Whereas he was always just this picture of, of, um, of sort of um, aloof calm. Funny enough, he had an affinity to man, you know, like so many elephants do. And yet, what is it? Man is the only person or animal on the earth that kills elephants. Elephants have really got no other uh, predators as such. He grew to trust these strange upright creatures which lived in his favorite winterthorn grove. They spoke to him in soothing voices and seemed interested in everything he did. And I mean we just started speaking to him because really there was nothing else to do and Gary and I were tired of speaking to each other. And you know you can you notice that you know the you know the elephants are coming and looking sniffing around your food or, or whatever it is so you're talking to them and we just thought there was not only, you know, it's not only uh, a case of trying to warn them off or discourage them from doing things, you also, you know, also just, just chat to them and greet them. And he was around so much, you just, and he had such a sort of presence about him, you just felt that it was only good manners to say good morning. The big boy became his sort of buddy, and uh, we had a, put a pole fence up around the camp, just two inch poles, and uh, it's quite strange, he got the other young bulls didn't like it and would walk through it, but he never did. He would walk up to the fence and stop there. He's just that sort of animal. Yeah, he just sort of, uh, he just spent a lot of time very near us. Big Boy was unaware that not all men are the same. It was the 16th of December 1996 because we were busy packing up the camp and ready to leave to go back to Johannesburg when I was showering and we heard the shots going off and I thought no, you could hear there were a couple of heavy hits and uh, realised it must be elephant and uh, not very far away. Uh, Mike Stark who was running the camp upstream from us came on the radio and picked up, there were only two scouts available at the time and picked them up and four of us went in and went to go and look for them. And we found the fresh poor where elephants that you could see they'd been running in panic. And uh, they split into two groups. Um, we let the scouts follow the one group and Mike and I followed the other group. Um, again, uh, in spite of the rain the night before, it was extremely hot. Uh, steamy um, and somewhere along the line we suddenly there was such silence and you know you, I don't know if you it's a sixth sense or what but you know something is amiss and we sat down and we just looked and looked with our binos couldn't see anything and looking back Mike said what is that about 50 meters behind us and you Looking through the binos, I could see a bit of ivory sticking under the, the bush. But what they'd done, it, uh, they'd shot an elephant and then cut shrubs quickly, and covered the elephant. So we nearly, we'd actually walked past it. We didn't realize it was there. But what warned us that there was something wrong, we, we have no idea. 
we lay there for an hour without anybody moving, just hiding, suspecting something was going on. And eventually we thought, well, they'd probably come back later. And we went to go and check the elephant. And then when we moved the, um, the bushes off the elephant, only then we realized it was big boy. And then all hell broke loose because the guys, as we suspected, there was something of this. They were on the other side of this clearing. And they started firing. And then we were sort of protected by big boy because all the bullets were just something into him. We managed to give them uh, cover fire and let the two scouts run and then we followed and uh, we went back to camp and we got on the radio to the main, main, main control of the Zawa department and they sent six more guys down with guns and we went back later that afternoon, much later. And you could hear them hacking away at uh, chopping the tusks out and then these guys started firing and then all the old broke loose was our six guys firing, Mike and I and anyway eventually they were routed and uh, we got there and they'd already moved the one tusk and the, th the second tusk was sort of halfway out and but by now it was starting to rain and it was late afternoon and well, at that stage, Mike and I just wanted to follow these guys because you were so annoyed about Big Boy and upset. Oh, I still had difficulty talking about it. Butch was faced with a terrible dilemma. How to tell his son that Big Boy was dead. How to break his heart. In the end, he left it to his family's matriarch, Chris's mother, Sue. I was a coward, I left it to Sue. They didn't tell him. I'd just gotten back, and, um, and uh, yeah, my mom told me when I got to jail. You know, I took a walk down the bottom of the garden, and, uh, yeah, yeah, just upset, really. Big Boy was gone, his death a monument to human greed. But as is the way of the African bush, his death gave birth to new life, as the sadness and anger felt by Boot and Chris slowly formed into the seed of an idea which was to chase the shadow of the poacher's gun far from the lower Zambezi Valley. Conservation Lower Zambezi is Big Boy's legacy to the valley that was his home, a way to move on and protect those who he left behind and those who have come after him. Formed by Boot and Chris and other tourism operators in the valley, its main task was to eradicate poaching. But over the years, CLZ has become much more valuable. It has become a bridge builder, establishing new levels of understanding between elephant and man. We had to do something. Uh, you couldn't just leave the valley uh, to the poachers who were running rampant. Yeah. The CLZ had already been in existence and it just started and then hadn't taken any traction or hadn't gotten going for whatever reason. Zawa at that time was battling financially. They, they had no vehicles and if they did have, they didn't have fuel. In the beginning it was just the operators supporting the Zawa officers who had no 
vehicle, you know, no boats, uh, no rations to go on patrol, no equipment to go on patrol with. There was just the need for, for some sort of body. From that time on, we kept uh, our game control operations going throughout the wet season, not just the dry season. And I think that made all the difference. If you look at the animals in the park now, I mean, just hundreds of kudu and elephant everywhere. The big boy's death spurred everybody into, into sort of stopping squabbling and, and, and most importantly, putting the anti-poaching um, as priority one. Now, CLZ is helping to ease the conflict which still exists. A conflict without guns. A conflict over food. In Muguramena, the old chief is troubled. As he builds a new home for his family, he worries about the crops in the fields. He is angry with the elephants and very scared of them. The elephants come at night and raid the crops. They break open the grain stores and feed on the precious maize which sustains the village. Anyone who tries to stop them is in mortal danger. Emotions run high. Fear and anger mix together with desperation. Some would kill the elephants, but others realize that they are worth more alive, attracting more and more tourists with each passing season. And with the tourists comes money and opportunities. Slowly, the villagers are learning that their future is vested in the survival of Big Boy's brethren and his legacy. It's more than a decade since Big Boy's untimely death. Had he lived, he would have seen his beloved valley filled with his kind, watched over and guarded by the men he trusted so willingly. Not far from where Big Boy fell, and close to the camp he made his home, CLZ's base is now a center of learning where those who protect also teach, sharing their wisdom and knowledge the way elephants always have. Here is where hope lives, hope for a better future for humans and elephants together in harmony. Conservation Law Zambezi has triumphed over the poachers. Its scouts constantly patrolling, policing, protecting. Now, it's time to focus efforts on finding a solution to the crop raiding and helping humans to better understand elephants and the other creatures they share their valley with. 
For now at least, tranquility has returned to the Lower Zambezi. Mother Africa is at peace. And the spirit of the mighty river, the Nyami Nyami, protector of the life-giving waters and those who depend on it, is pleased, bringing bounty to this beautiful land. The wheel of life turns steadily, the demise of the old and weak giving way to the rise of the young and healthy. Each day, the rituals of survival play out, everything imperceptibly linked together, interdependent, intertwined. and cushioned feet once more tread softly to the water's edge. The river whispering its age-old secrets and visions of things past and yet to come. In the Winterthorn Grove, the wind stirs softly through the canopy. Dislodging the seed pods so loved by elephants. If you close your eyes, you can almost hear the gentle flapping of giant ears and a soft rumble of contentment. Big Boy may be gone, but his son still roam the valley So often you get a young bull who looks at you and you, you know that look in his eye and you think, Allah, I know who your dad is, you know. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a few sort of big bulls in that in the area now that remind me of him, but there's nothing quite like him.
His spirit is everywhere, in every ripple at the river's edge, every breath of the warm afternoon breeze, and every ray of the setting sun. Like the mighty Zambezi, the memory of Big Boy is eternal.